Hello, everybody. So I'm, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this talk on behalf of myself, Shashank Bishnoi from IIT Delhi, and on behalf of Professor Fernando Martirena, who's here as well. Hello, everybody. My name is Fernando Martirena. I'm very pleased to be here, to join you here for this webinar, and uh, look forward to sharing with you information about lime, limestone calcite grain cement. So uh, this talk will be divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the production and the hydration of limestone calcite clay cement. In the second part, Professor Fernando Martirena will talk about uh, concrete produced using LC3. So first of all, let's see how LC3 is produced. What LC3 is, is LC3 is a blend of clinker, which you know already, which is the main component of most of the cements uh, that are used around the world along with calcine clay and limestone. Limestone is a similar type of a limestone uh, that we use for the production of clinker. You know what clinker is already, like I said. What we do with the clay is we heat the clay to a temperature where uh, it's sufficiently hot that it decomposes. There is water in the clay which gets uh, removed. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a chemically combined water which breaks the crystalline structure of the clay and makes the clay reactive in alkaline conditions. Additionally, what we do is we grind limestone along with the clay and we mix it together with the clinker to produce what we call LC3 or limestone calcine clay cement. What is this calcination thing that I talked about? In calcination, what you do is you take clays. Now, a lot of people are worried about clays because they think that good quality clays aren't available around the world. When you think of clay, you think of what is, used, what is uh, called as China clay. China clay is usually used for the production of ceramics, papers, and you know, high, high end expensive applications. But here we're talking about would be a waste clay in many of these mines. And this kind of a clay would be found almost everywhere in the world, in a lot of geologies at least. It's a clay which has a lower amount of kaolinite than the China clay would have. And how kaolinite? You see this kaolinite in this graph over here, where this clay is decomposing at a high temperature between 450 and 650 degrees centigrade. And when it decomposes, then it loses some weight, it loses some water, and the crystal structure changes. You get an amorphous material which becomes reactive. That amorphous material is known as metakaolin. In the clays that we are talking about, this material makes 40 to 60% of the calcine clay. They're usually calcined and uh, at high temperatures in different kinds of technologies. We, I'm showing you an example of a rotary kiln here, but it could be calcined in a flash calciner, in a static calciner, lots of different ways. So this is what it looks like after it's calcined in this cal calciner, and you've got this clay, you, you look at this grain inside, you've got different minerals that are formed as a result of this calcination process. So what happens is you convert this highly crystalline structure that you can see in the a diffractogram over here into this more amorphous structure which becomes more reactive in alkaline conditions and that's where the magic of lc3 lies it's uh, about the it's about the reactivity of the calcine clay but along with that it's reactivity with limestone without this limestone uh, this clay would simply have a pozzolanic reaction with the clinker where the calcium hydroxide that is produced from clinker particles from the clinker grains during hydration would get combined with the calcine clay to produce calcium aluminosilicate hydrate. However, the presence of limestone particles also leads to another reaction between the carbonates that are there in the limestone with the alumina that's there in the calcine clay. When these two react together, they form carboaluminate phases and these carboaluminate phases give us a denser microstructure, which give us a better strength and a higher durability despite having a lower clinker content. So whereas a Portland cement would have 90 to 95 percent clinker, a fly ash based pozzolanic cement would have 60 to 65 or 70 percent clinker. LC3 may have 50 percent or even less clinker and despite that still have the same type of strength as the other cements would at least in the long term. So what's happening in this hydration? Like I said, the clinker phases like C3S and C2S when they react with water, they go through this reaction of hydration. They produce calcium silicate hydrate. And there's some additional calcium that was there in the C3S and C2S that is not consumed in the CSH. It forms calcium hydroxide. There's more such calcium coming from A-lite. There's lesser of that calcium that's coming from B-lite. This calcium hydroxide can later react with 
uh, aluminosilicates that are there in pozzolanic materials and produce calcium aluminosilicate hydrates. The CSH is the main glue in cementitious systems. So more is the amount of CSH that's there. It helps in a finer microstructure. It helps in a, uh, in a, uh, in a stronger microstructure. But then additionally, like I said, in LC3, because of the presence of calcium carbonate that you see as CC bar over here, the calcium hydroxide can react along with the aluminosilicate hydrate and the calcium hydroxide in water to give you carboaluminate phases. Here you see hemi-carboaluminate phase where, uh, where the carbonate phase is incorporated along with the aluminate phase. And this is also a crystalline material that fills uh, the microstructure, refines the microstructure and gives us a good strength. Now, even the calcium aluminosilicate hydrate that is formed, it's similar to what's formed in the other cements, although the chemical composition is not exactly the same. Here, what you're seeing in this figure, in this, uh, in this slide, is on the, on the left side, you see a micrograph of an ordinary Portland cement. On the right side, you see a micrograph of an LC3. Points have been picked on these micrographs uh, to, uh, to carry out a chemical analysis at those points. And what is seen is this, that in the case of, uh, in the case of ordinary Portland cement, the average silicon to calcium ratio is lower than what is seen in, in, in the case of an LC3. Also, the amount of alumina is higher in the case of an LC3 compared to an ordinary Portland cement, but that's not very surprising because in an LC3, we've got more calcine clay, we've got, we've got more alumina, and we've got more silica than we do in the case of ordinary Portland cement. So CSH is this very adaptive, very um, uh, versatile kind of a hydration product that changes based on whatever is available in the system. Other products also change in the system. What happens is, because of the presence of this carbonate, you start to have these carboaluminate phases that are forming. So if you had a uh, Portland cement, you would have a monosulfate kind of a phase. A monosulfate phase is what is formed when alumina continues to react after the sulfate in the system is exhausted. However, in the case of LC3, what happens is uh, that because of the presence of, these, uh, of this carbonate, more and more of etringite forms and this etringite does not get converted into monosulfate. We're going to talk a little bit about that afterwards. At the same time, we start to form monocarboaluminate and hemicarboaluminate phases because of the presence of limestone and because of the presence of alumina. Uh, you see here that in an ordinary Portland cement, you would have a reduction of etringite with time because of the additional reaction of aluminate and the conversion to monosulfate but that would not happen in an LC3 system. However, in an ordinary Portland cement, you would see the calcium hydroxide content continuously increasing with time. However, in the case of, uh, in the case of LC3, because we have less amount of clinker, because we have less amount of calcium, the calcium hydroxide continues to reduce with time. It depends on how pure your clay is. It depends on how much kaolinite content your clay contains. If you have a higher silica content, you're going to have a lower calcium hydroxide content in the end, but then you're also going to have a finer microstructure. So although if you had a lower purity clay, the calcium hydroxide content may have increased at first and stayed a bit constant, but if you have a higher purity clay or a higher kaolinite content clay, the calcium hydroxide content would reduce with time, and that's how you're producing all that additional CSH. But then the question comes, why does etringite not reduce with time? So like I said, what happens normally is when you've got additional alumina, that etringite gets converted because of that additional alumina into, into monosulfate phase. However, when there are carbonate ions that are available, the, uh, the, the, this reaction gets converted into another reaction where you've got the production of uh, hemicarboaluminate phase and the uh, uh, and, uh, uh, monocarboaluminate phase and so on. So that way you get the uh, you get the uh, uh, you get the stabilization of etringite in a way. It's not really that etringite is stabilized, but then the etringite you see in this kind of a reaction would be produced again. Essentially, the new alumina that becomes available can react with the carbonate phase and produce carboaluminate phases instead of producing uh, a monosulfate phase. And it all has to do with the solubility product of these materials. So uh, the monocarboaluminate and etringite combination would be the most favored amongst all the possibilities. Although you have to remember that because carbonate is a slowly dissolving phase, 
you may form hemicarboaluminate first, which contains less amount of carbonate, and that might very slowly convert into monocarboaluminate in the long term. This reaction may be so slow that you may not even see it in the uh, on the scale of, of the first few months. So this is what happens if you change the purity of the clay or if you change the amount of clay that's available to react per gram of the binder in LC3. What you see is uh, you start to reduce the calcium hydroxide content that's available. These calculations that you're seeing are on the basis of uh, uh, are on the basis of thermodynamic calculations. This is not experiment. These are not experimental results. These are thermodynamic calculations. As you add more and more of clay, you get uh, or calcine clay, you get less and less of calcium hydroxide. You get more, more and more of ettringite that stays available. And because of the presence of uh, of calcite, you see a very small amount of calcite is consumed. But even that gives you a very large volume of carboaluminate. If you go into systems where you may have higher, even higher amount of um, aluminosilicates available, you might start to form stratlingite instead of the formation of, uh, of monocarboaluminate in those cases. Here, what you're seeing is if your clay had different purity, what would be the degree of hydration of that clay in a system that contains 30% uh, calcine clay? If a clay was 100% pure, uh, this is what it might mean. If your, uh, if your clay was 35% pure, this is the degree of hydration that it would mean for that clay. Now, the hydration of this system also depends on how much of sulfates and how much of alkalis are there. <coughs> we are already aware of how the sulfates influence, um, influence the hydration of aluminates. Here in this graph, what you're seeing is, as we add more and more amount of sulfate, the second hydration peak in LC3 starts to get delayed. That second hydration peak is the peak of aluminate hydration, and that gets delayed if you have more and more of uh, gypsum. So when you're designing LC3 cement, what we usually try to do is we try to make sure that this second peak that's appearing, it appears after the first peak is finished. If that happens, then the alite has been able to react properly before the aluminate starts to react, and we get an overall better performance of the cement. This is one relatively simple way to balance the amount of sulfate that is there in the cement. Here you're seeing we are increasing the sulfate content from zero to around 7%. In this case, the balance would be somewhere between three to 5% of sulfate. The same kind of thing happens with alkalis as well. Here you're seeing uh, uh, potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide being added to the cement. The amount of heat of hydration that is liberated from the hydration of LC3 increases as we increase the uh, alkali content. This also leads to an increase in the early age strength of the cement, but in the long term, it may have uh, negative influence. There's usually a balance, uh, uh, an optimum sulfate content, an op optimum, sorry, alkali content somewhere in the middle. You see an effect of the alkali sulfates over here where potassium sulfate and sodium sulfate has been added to the cement. Well, you see that the behavior changes, the alite reaction is being accelerated. The aluminate reaction, the amount of aluminate reaction is getting changed because of the amount of sulfate that is available in the system. And there are different hypotheses to what this reaction is, but it's usually assumed that this is the aluminate that is available in the clinker itself that is reacting at this age over here. Now, an excellent thing that's happening as a result of all of this hydration is one, this hydration is happening quite rapidly. And second, when this hydration is happening as a result of the finer particles, well, it's because of the fine particles, but it's not quite as simple as that either. It's a very complicated thing that's happening in the microstructure. We end up getting a highly refined microstructure. We get a microstructure that has a similar threshold or breakthrough diameter uh, within three days or seven days that an ordinary Portland cement does after 14 or 28 days. That means despite shorter curing, you're able to achieve a finer microstructure, a denser microstructure, which is likely to have a lower permeability. And Professor Martirena is going to explain to you later how that lower permeability is important. Here, what you also see is despite the higher porosity, a lot of that porosity is on the finer side, is in the finer pores, whereas the coarser pores are much smaller in volume, and that helps, that really helps in reducing the permeability of concrete. Professor Martirena is going to explain you more from this point. Thank you. Thank you, Shashang, for uh, giving me the floor. 
So uh, now we're going to talk more about practical applications of uh, concrete and uh, uh, products uh, containing calcined clays and limestone, like Elsie's free system. Uh, we first of all we have to remember that calcined clays they have a very high specific surface, meaning that they have a, high, a, a higher wood demand, and probably we need to increase the dosage of uh, plasticizers to make them flow. But uh, in our experience, we have seen that PCE-based uh, uh, super plasticizers that work pretty well. And the good news is that we, we are able to see very, very good cohesion in concrete, very little bleeding. And I mean, in terms of uh, concrete where you need a big flow like self-compacting concrete, you, you, you get very uh, interesting results. Uh, here we're seeing the water reducing a, a, a admixtures in pumpable concrete and uh, as you see here we're comparing the uh, Portland cement uh, concrete mixes in different grades. Uh, so we're comparing a low strength to high strength concrete and we're comparing this with two combinations of uh, uh, Portland cement and the mineral addition LC2. Here in the first one we're adding only 30% LC2 and the other one is almost half and half. And what we're seeing here is that uh, uh, concrete, I mean, the higher the amount of concrete, the higher the dosage. And also the slump retention, the slump retention is uh, less here. So those are things that the uh, mixture companies are working right now. And uh, we, we, we forecast that we're going to have very interesting results in very, very soon about that. So what we're seeing here, we're comparing a concrete made with 50% uh, of uh, LC2, meaning 50% uh, clinker, with the concrete having uh, fly ash as a mixture. Here, we're seeing that even to make a very flowable concrete, we have a marginal reduction in the amount of dosage, I mean, plasticizer, water reducing agent, and uh, we see a perfect circle, meaning you see no bleeding, you see a very good cohesion, so this material uh, is very suitable for these kind of applications. In terms of strength, uh, we're having a similar trend to what we're seeing in, in, in uh, standard motors. So uh, despite the fact that it only has 50% of clinker, the LC3 concrete uh, has similar strength value almost at all ages. Even at one day, it's, it's in the same range as, as the uh, concrete made with, uh, uh, for instance, fly ash or slack or even OPC. And you see at 28 days, uh, it's, it levels off and has the same strength as Portland cement. And uh, it doesn't grow too much in the next so 50, 90 days. There is not much growth in that because the, this reaction of the alumina uh, takes place at very early ages. And this is what we're getting. So we'll get a very, very dense microstructure very early on. In terms of carbonation, we have to we have here the same problem that uh, we have everywhere we're using a blended cement, that we have a higher carbonation. Of course, we need to have the conditions for this carbonation, which is uh, relative humidity and uh, and uh, and of course, since we're having uh, less clinker, you know, clinker is 70% limestone. You you decarbonate less limestone, you produce less uh, calcium oxide. Therefore, in the system, you have less calcium hydroxide, and the buffer for calcium for carbonation is uh, is less. Therefore, you are prone to have uh, more carbonation. However, these systems, uh, same as uh, blended cement systems, they are very sensitive to curing. For instance, you see here with the curing time of three days, you almost get the same carbonation like the one you get if you're having a Portland cement uh, curing one day. So normally, like in every blended cement, you need to have, you, you need to be careful about curing, but you can get decent results of carbonation. And when I tell you when I show you the, the real results in real life, you will see that this is this is confirmed. The uh, spectacular performance is in terms of chloride and, and migration, in, ingress and migration. Here we're comparing different binders and we're making, we're seeing here on the left side, the chloride profiling of these elements and we're seeing Portland cement is the worst of all. I mean, you have even at, at 30 millimeters depth, you have uh, chlorides present. Then you have slag, you have fly ash. I mean, they, they are better than, Port, than Portland cement, but the best of all of all, all materials containing calcine clays, and especially those containing the, the combination of calcine clays and limestone, so reinforcing the concept of the synergy that we have described before between calcine clays and limestone. And you see here that from 10 millimeters on, we almost have no chlorides. And, uh, and when you check on the right side, the apparent diffusion coefficient, you see 
that this is uh, orders of magnitude smaller than than in case of Portland cement. So we 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 have a very good performance in terms of uh, stopping chlorides from entering into the into the cementitious matrix. Again, here we have the rapid chloride permeability test, which has been carried out again in uh, Portland cement concrete, concrete containing 30% uh, fly ash. Remember, in these cases, we're having a minimum of 65% clean content and the and the concrete made with S3. The, the, the values in red are the 28 days RCPT and the values in blue are 90 days. The interesting thing here, remember, we're measuring the current that is uh, going through the uh, uh, slice of concrete and the higher the columns that you're measuring, it is the higher the, 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 the uh, electrons that are going through the matrix. And uh, you see here the lowest values we have for in, in every case for LC3 concrete, even for different different qualities of uh, even the low strength uh, uh, LC3 concrete, they have very, very low and very similar and there's a very, very little difference between 28 days and 90 days uh, reinforcing the fact that the microstructure is already well, well built up at, uh, at 28 days and we have excellent results. Surface reactivity, resistivity is also a very uh, interesting index of the density of the pore structure. So basically you're measuring the, the, the resistivity of a current going through the matrix here we're measuring in three different kinds of uh, concrete, uh, 30 MPa, 50 MPa, and a mix, as they call it C-mix, where they have the same amount of binder in all the concretes. And we're again comparing Portland cement with, lime, uh, with fly ash cement and LC3. And you see here, it's, it's orders of magnitude higher than, than any of the others. So LC3 is at least three, four times higher than even uh, fly ash, which is considered to be because of the postalanic effect, a good, uh, good uh, concrete. So if we have these results, we can forecast that we're going to have very good performance in terms of steel corrosion in the, and we will, we will see later. Here is also showing the, the robustness of this system. Normally we do all the forecast of durability based on specimens that are custom lab conditions, and then we bring them to the field and in the field conditions are different. Like you see here for uh, fly ash concrete, you see, a difference of three times higher the total charge in uh, compared to lab specimens, where in LC3 concrete you, you barely see any difference between the, the, the values you get in the lab and the values you get in the field, meaning that this system is very robust also when, when, it's, when concrete is placed under conditions on, on the field. So here in terms of shrinkage, uh, we see a slight marginal increase in autogenous shrinkage in, in LC3 concrete, but we have a similar trend more or less to, to the rest of the, of the cement, so we don't see any major difference. Again, in total shrinkage, we see slightly higher values, but uh, I mean, no, no, no indications of change here, so we see a similar condition in, in, in LC3 compared to the other uh, PC and fly ash concrete. And here, alkali silica reaction, we see an impressive performance of, of LC3 concrete. So here, we prepare specimens with very reactive aggregates, and we, we did them with Portland cement, and we did them with LC3. And you see here, the uh, specimens cast with uh, Portland cement, after 28 days, they went past the boundary for expansion, I mean, the, the threshold of expansion, so they, they quickly expanded. Whereas in the case of uh, LC3 concrete, you see even after three years, you see no expansion at all. And we know the reason why. First of all, we because we're reducing the amount of clinking, we're diluting the, 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 the alkalis in the system. Therefore, we're reducing the, the alkalis in the system. But also, and most important, is that we're increasing the amount of alumina in the pore solution. And the alumina normally adsorbs on the reactive sites, also inhibiting expansion and that's very important in terms of applications for countries where reactive aggregates are a are, are hurdle uh, for the application of concrete. So now we'll show you a couple of examples of uh, concrete produced in real life. Remember in this case we're, we're working with building companies, I mean no lab conditions, no uh, special preparation and everything. We're replacing Portland cement by LC3 on a one-to-one -one basis. We're trying to uh, assess it in, in a great variety of applications because our opinion is that we can use LC3 as a regular uh, general use cement in all applications and also 
uh, we are exploring some strategies to, uh, to, in terms of the process, grinding the cement to reduce the water cement caused by the presence of cast iron clays. So here you see hollow concrete blocks. This is one of the most used materials in Cuba, Latin America, and probably in the world. And we're using this, uh, we're producing this with a material that we, we, we produced in an industrial trial back in 2013. You see here, the target strength was 5 MPA at 28 days. We use the same amount of, of, of Portland cement and LC3 per cubic meter, 300 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. And you can see there the, the results of compressive strength, seven days, 28 days. We had the very, very good, uh, uh, very similar results of, of strength at all ages. And um, so this is uh, a material that can be, that can be used as a general use. Also, we did some trials casting concrete. In this case, we were casting a 25 MPA concrete. You see uh, what, what I told you about the flow. I mean, you can get a decent flow by using the, the uh, LC3. And we measured, so we were using exactly the same amount of Portland cement per cubic meter, 360 uh, kilograms of cement for a 25 MPA uh, concrete. And you see here, despite the fact that we had to sli slightly increase the water cement ratio to 0 0.57, we were able to get at all ages the same, more or less the same strength, and I mean, similar strength. And of course, we outperformed the, the, the design strength. This is the strategy that we're using to, um, to cope uh, with the problem of excessive water demand when you use calcine clays. Rather than, than, than grinding them all together to avoid excess grinding of the, of the uh, harder particles of clinker, for instance, we grind them separately and we produce the mineral addition we call LC2, which is uh, calcine clay, limestone and gypsum. And then on the side, we can combine it with Portland cement, uh, hopefully uh, very pure Portland cement, and then we can make uh, LC350 when, when we use it at the, at the mixer. Of course, this gives you more flexibility in terms of blending the material because you can have different uh, proportions between Portland cement and LC2, and and this is uh, dependent. So you can you can have uh, more options when you are designing your strategy for the use of the binder. And I will show you some of the res of the examples where we have done this uh, uh, up to now. We did an industrial trial in uh, back in 2018, and we were able to produce 1,000 tons of LC2. The interesting thing also about this LC2 is that shelf life is very, very long. So you can use this product, and you see here you have the 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 uh, the, the uh, Portland cement P35, and you have 50% of P35 and 50% of LC2, and you outperform. Uh, Portland cement by, by blending this is and this is very interesting. Also, you see that you increase the clinker content and you don't you only see a marginal increase in the strength, meaning that you can work very efficiently with around 50% uh, clinker content. Here in terms of rheology, you see we're blending different different amounts of Portland cement and LC2. And you see we can get like we said, like we said before, we can get a very cohesive concrete even with uh, replacing almost half of the Portland cement that you have in the system. So here you have 45% of LC2 and you get a very, very good uh, flow. And uh, you will see later that there's hardly no impact in terms of the strength of the material. So you can replace half of the Portland cement and you, and you can get uh, uh, the similar strength as when you're using pure Portland cement. And of course, we're using here water cement ratio around 0.4 and a spread of and we uh, almost 55 centimeters. So this is almost a self-compacting concrete. This is a real example. We are building a bridge, and this is one of the girders of the bridge where we have placed some sensors. And this is uh, produced in a real uh, workshop. I mean, using the normal tools with uh, the workers there. I mean, we were replacing a one-to-one -one basis, and you see. We even from the first day we get we get very impressive strength. I tell you to get 50 per 50 MPAs at 28 days uh, uh, with the cement uh, having 50% clinker and with the quality of the aggregates in Cuba, which is very bad. This is really a success, and this was a very good application. Here you see a high strength, a high end application. This is a, a deep uh, pyre foundation. It was. Uh, done in, in, in the northern coast of Cuba, 
Then they used to have silica fume to make a very, very impermeable, very strong concrete, and we were able to replace silica fume by, by LC2, and, and the results were outstanding. You have to bear in mind that silica fume, the cost of silica fume is uh, roughly 10 times, 20 times the cost of LC2. So this is also from the economic viewpoint is very attractive. And uh, now we'll show you some of the results that we had uh, on, on uh, ex uh, durability under natural conditions. Back in 2014, we were able to build uh, this exposure site on the northern coast of Cuba, where you have a very high uh, relative humidity. You are, uh, I mean, you have everything. We call it the torture chamber for concrete because you have everything. You, you have two dry and dry and wet cycles per day because of the tidal movements and there we have cast uh, concrete and we have laid uh, blocks of concrete made with Portland cement and also made with LC3 cement and every year we take cores and we investigate the cores. Because of the high relative humidity you see that there's there's barely almost no carbonation taking place both in PC and, and LC3. This is what I told you before if if there are no conditions for carbonation it doesn't take place and uh, also you see in terms of chloride, you have a very good pro uh, profile. Here you see the resistivity we have measured in the course. And again, we see the trend. So three, four times higher resistivity, meaning that we're going to have very good performance on corrosion. And here's the proof. You see those are rebars taken from uh, concrete uh, blocks that are exposed there for more than five years on the exposure side. You see on the right, the uh, rebar from PC concrete is already corroded, whereas on the left you see the, the rebar from LC3 concrete, no signs of corrosion whatsoever. So meaning that we have an interesting performance in terms of durability for this concrete. Summarizing, uh, we have a synergy between the calcine clay and limestone, and, uh, and it modifies the phase assemblage in the system, but we have to say that we're still uh, dealing with a Portland cement uh, system, meaning that we're not going to have any surprise in 50 years in terms of durability. So the same, we have the same phases that we have in in the Portland cement system, only that they are, uh, I mean, the proportions is different. Because of the presence of the calcine case, we we see a refinement uh, of the pore structure, and uh, even because even if we're decreasing the amount of clinker to a half, we see a strength that is comparable to pure Portland cement. And we also see an improved durability performance in most conditions compared to any other of the supplementary cementitious materials that are currently used. Uh, of course, we see a faster carbonation, which is normally expected in all low carbon cements where you reduce clinker. And we have had an experience in a wide range of applications. Uh, we have created, uh, because of the high demand for this, uh, the uh, Rylem has created uh, a TC uh, that started in August 2018 and is due to finish in August 2023. We have a good uh, demand from the industry and the academia. We have more than 60 members and we're covering almost all the aspects of uh, the use of calcine clays, like clay characterization, process calcination, hydration, cementitious uh, materials, applications in concrete, durability of concrete. So right now we are preparing around 15 white papers, technical white papers that are going to be published in materials and structures. And then we will compile them into a final technical report to be released at the end of 22nd. So I invite you, all of you, to join Ryland, especially young scientists, young PhD students, and participate in this TC, in TC uh, uh, and, and work. Having said that, on behalf of Professor Bishnoi and myself, I thank you for your attention and I hope that this uh, information is interesting for you and we look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.